section thirty one of my strange rescue this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen my strange rescue by james macdonald oxley birds and beasts on sable island if you will take your atlas and turn to the map of canada you may by looking very carefully discover a small spot in the atlantic ocean almost due east from nova scotia and close beside the sixtieth parallel of longitude this little lonely spot is sable island there it lies in the midst of the waves a long low bank of gray sand without a single tree upon it from end to end nay not so much as a bush behind which a baby might play hide and seek it seems therefore at first sight to be one of the most unfavorable places in the world for the study of either birds or beasts yet strange as it may seem this island which is now but twenty miles long and at its greatest breadth but a mile and a half wide once it was quite double that size has a wonderfully interesting history of its own of which not the least entertaining chapter is that relating to its furry and feathered inhabitants although when first viewed from the sea sable island appears to be nothing better than a barren sandbank on closer acquaintance it reveals inside its sloping beaches vales and meadows that in summer time seem like bits out of a western prairie there are green grassy knolls and enchanting dells with placid ponds in their midst and if you only come at the right time and stay long enough you may gather pink roses blue lilies china asters wild pea gay goldenrod and what is still better strawberries blueberries and cranberries in bountiful profusion our concern at present however is not with the fruits and flowers but with the fur and feather of this curious place seeing that sable island has no trees on the branches of which nests may be built it follows naturally that its winged inhabitants are altogether of the waterfowl and seabird variety all over the sides and tops of the sand hills which rise to the height of thirty forty or fifty feet the gulls gannets terns and other aquatic birds scrape together their miserable apologies for nests and hatch out their ugly little squab chicks making such a to-do about the business that the whole air is filled with their chattering clanging and screaming they are indeed very disagreeable neighbors for besides the horrid din they are ceaselessly making they are the most untidy not to say filthy of housekeepers after they have occupied their bird barracks as their nesting places might appropriately be called for a few weeks the odor the odor the wind bears from that direction could never be mistaken for one of those spicy breezes which are reputed to blow soft or ceylon's isle then they have not the redeeming quality of being fit to eat for unless one were on the very edge of starvation one taste of their flesh rank with suggestions of fish and train oil would be sufficient to banish all appetite they have one or two good qualities they are brave for at the peril of their lives they will dauntlessly attack any rash intruder upon their domains swooping down upon him with sharp cries and still sharper beaks their movements illustrate the poetry of motion as they come sailing grandly in from the ocean spaces and circle about their own particular hillock in glorious dips and curves and mountings upward that fill the human observer with longing and envy much more satisfactory however are the black duck sheldrake plover curlew and snipe 
which nests by uncounted thousands in the dense grass that girts the fresh-water ponds and afford dainty dishes for the table it is easy to work to make a fine bag on a favorable day and grand sport may be had by any one who knows how to handle a double barrel many are the interesting stories connected with bird life on sable island but a single one and that the oddest of them all must suffice i give it upon the unimpeachable authority of dr j bernard gilpin about forty years or more ago a lot of rabbits were sent there as an experiment the idea was if they prospered to furnish the human inhabitants of the island with a pleasant variety from the salt junk which generally adorned their tables the experiment succeeded admirably bunny found the firm dry sands just the thing for his burrows while the abundant wild pea and other herbage furnished unstinted food for his prolific brood but one fateful day in spring a dark day in the annals of rabbitdom a big snowy owl that had somehow lost his bearings and been driven out to sea by a westerly gale dropped wearily upon the island to rest his tired pinions while sitting on a sand-heap thankful at his escape from a watery grave he looked about him and to his amazed delight beheld of all sights the most welcome in the world to a hungry owl rabbits rabbits young and rabbits old rabbits plump and rabbits lean rabbits in sixes and rabbits in sevens were frisking about in the long grass and over the sand merrily innocent of their peril at first sir owl could scarcely believe his eyes for it was a bright sunny day and owls cannot see very well when the sun is shining but presently as he still squatted on the sand perfectly motionless except his eyelids blinking solemnly a thoughtless little rabbit which had grown too much excited over a game of chase with his brother to look where he was going ran up against the bewildered bird this awoke the owl thoroughly with a quick spring that sent all the other little cottontails scampering off to their burrows in wild affright he fastened his long claws in the back of his unfortunate disturber and without even stopping to say grace made a dinner off him on the spot that was a red-letter day in the owl's calendar thenceforth he revelled in rabbit for breakfast dinner and supper and had he been a very greedy owl might have kept his discovery of a rabbit bonanza all to himself but he didn't with a splendid unselfishness which some bipeds without feathers might advantageously imitate he had no sooner recruited his strength than off he posted to the mainland to spread the good news four days later he came back but not alone this time bearing him company were his brothers his sisters his cousins his uncles and his aunts in such numbers that ere the summer ended there was not a solitary bunny left upon the island since then the place has been restocked and there having been no return of the owls the rabbits despite the fact that great numbers of them are killed for food have so multiplied as to become a positive nuisance and the experience of australia being in view the advisability of their extermination is seriously considered besides the rabbits there have been at different times the following animals upon sable island namely the black fox white bear walrus and seals wild horses cattle and swine rats cats and dogs that makes quite a long list of course so small and bare an island could never have held them all at once now they are all gone except the rabbits the horses of which several hundreds still scamper wild over the sand dunes and the seals which come every year to introduce their shiny little whelps into the world and to grow fat on the fish hurled continually upon the beach by the tireless breakers it is a great many years since the black fox white bear and walrus were last seen upon the island 
too much money could be made out of them when dead for the fishermen who knew of their presence to let them live long and so with powder and shot and steel they were ruthlessly exterminated the beautiful skins of the black fox worth one hundred golden crowns each went principally to france where they were made up into splendid robes for royalty just how the wild horses and cattle found their way to sable island is not positively known they were first heard of in those early days when ships loaded with cattle grain and farming utensils were coming over in little fleets from europe to help to settle america in all likelihood some of these vessels got cast away on the island for it has ever been a dreadful place for wrecks and in some way the animals managed to scramble safe ashore and thus the place became populated the wild cattle disappeared early in the century but the horses or rather ponies are still there and very interesting creatures they are winter and summer they are out on the sand in all weathers indeed they scorn to go under cover even in the wildest storms and although shelters have been built for them they will not deign to enter them another curious thing about them is that they are never seen to lie down and apparently go to sleep standing there are now about four hundred of these ponies divided into troops each under the charge and control of an old stallion whose shaggy unkempt mane and tail sweep the ground as he stands sentinel over his numerous family they belong to the dominion government and it has been usual to cull out some forty or fifty of the best of them each year and send them up to halifax where they command good prices they are stanch sturdy little animals and very serviceable when properly broken in my boyhood days i rejoiced in the possession of a fine bay that barring a provoking habit of pitching an unwary rider over his head was a great source of enjoyment the manner of catching the ponies is for a number of mounted men to surround a band and drive it into a corral in which a tame pony has been placed as a decoy this is often a very exciting experience the cracking of whips shouting of men neighing of ponies combined with the plunging of the frightened captives and the gallant charges of the enraged stallions to make up a scene not readily forgotten once safely corralled the best males are picked out and lassoed and the rest turned loose to breathe the salt air of freedom once more as the breed has been observed to be degenerating greatly of late years means have been taken to improve it and it is probable that ere long sable island ponies will be more desirable than ever a very amusing thing in connection with animal life on sable island is the story of the rats cats and dogs first of all were the rats who are reputed to be very clever about deserting sinking ships and who here found plenty of opportunity to show their cleverness for wrecks are always happening they thus became so plentiful that they threatened to eat the human inhabitants out of house and home indeed they did make them do without bread for three whole months upon one occasion this state of things of course could not be tolerated a large number of cats were accordingly imported and they soon cleared the premises of the rapacious rodents but it was not long ere the pussies in their turn grew so numerous wild and fierce as to become a source of serious trouble a small army of dogs was therefore brought upon the scene and they made short work of the cats thus rounding out a very curious cycle did space permit i could tell something about the seals and their very quaint and attractive ways and manners but perhaps enough has been already written to convince readers that however lonely barren and insignificant sable island may seem it has an interesting story of its own which is well worth the telling end of section thirty one section thirty two of my strange rescue 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Scott, Cheltenham, England. My Strange Rescue by James MacDonald Oxley. The Boar of Minas Basin upon the side of one of the rounded hills that rise up gently from the wonderful sea of verdure which longfellow without ever looking upon it for himself immortalized in his evangeline acacia villa nestled cosily in the midst of many trees long lines of poplars stood sentinel-like up and down the house front and marked out the garden boundaries furnishing abundant supplies of peppers for the boys in springtime and better still a whole regiment of apple and pear trees marshalled itself at the back filling the hearts and mouths of both young and old with delight in the autumn when the boughs bent so temptingly beneath their burden of fruitage there could hardly be a more attractive location for a boarding school and seeing what comfortable quarters mr thompson provided and how thoroughly he understood the business of teaching it was no wonder that boys came not only from all parts of nova scotia and new brunswick but even from the united states to be grounded in classics mathematics and literature under his direction the last boarder left acacia villa long ago but twenty years back its dormitories were filled to their utmost capacity with lads of all ages and sizes and the whole neighbourhood felt the stirring influence of two score lively hearty noisy boys in their midst for nearly ten months out of the year the school was like a hive of bees in honey time the term beginning in september and finishing in june it was coming on toward midsummer now and excitement ran high throughout the school for while the drones were looking forward longingly to the holidays which would release them from all horrid lesson learning for a couple of months the workers were even more eagerly expecting the final examinations when books bats balls knives and other things dear to the schoolboy's heart were offered by wise mr thompson to the boys who came out ahead in the different branches of study the two boys strolling down toward the river this fine summer afternoon were good representatives of the two classes frank hamilton being one of the brightest and most ambitious as tom peters or bunty in the saucy slang of his schoolmates was one of the dullest and least aspiring in the school yet somehow or other they had been great chums ever since they came by the same coach to the villa two years before one could easily understand that lazy good-natured bunty should find much to admire and love in handsome manly clever frank who was indeed a born leader but just what frank found in tom to make him so fond of him puzzled everybody from mr thompson down in whatever lay the secret the fact was clear that the boys loved each other like brothers and the master who delighted in classical allusions used to greet them as damon and pythias when he encountered them together they were discussing the approaching examinations and speculating as to the prizes mr thompson would offer this year no apples for me on that tree said tom adding with rather a rueful smile if mr thompson would only offer a prize for the most lickings and impositions i guess i'd run the best chance for it never mind old boy said frank consolingly you weren't cut out for a scholar that's clear but you'll come out all right at something else and perhaps make a bigger name than even yankee himself although it wouldn't do to let him hear you say so i'm afraid i'd have a poor sight to beat yankee at anything answered tom but say frank how do you feel about giving him a go by for the star prize it'd break my heart if you didn't come out first well to tell the truth bunty i don't feel any too cocky about it yankee's a tough customer to be replied frank but hush he's coming right behind us must be going down to the river too though it's more like him to stick in his room and grind and as a tall slight dark-faced lad of about sixteen went past them without exchange of greetings the two friends stopped talking and went on in silence yankee was the nickname given to one of the american boys at the school he had been thus distinguished because both in face and figure he bore some resemblance to the typical uncle sam being longer leaner and sallower than any of his companions he was of a quiet reserved disposition and had few friends indeed he did not seem to desire many but kept very much to himself 
so that a lot of the boys disliked him yet on the other hand others respected although they might not love him for not only did he divide with frank hamilton whom they all worshipped the highest honours in scholarship but once when scarlet fever broke out and seized upon six of the smallest boys before they could escape to their homes yankee or to give him his proper name emery haynes although he had never had the fever himself stayed with mr thompson through many anxious weeks and watched night after night by the sufferers bedsides showing such tact and devotion as a nurse that the doctor said at least two of the boys would never have been saved from death had it not been for his help walking with a rapid almost impatient step that was characteristic of him emery haynes passed the two friends all three directing their course towards the gasperio river which cuts a wide red gash through the grand pre before adding its turbid torrent to the tossing waters of minas basin if yankee beats me for the star prize it will be the biggest disappointment of my life continued frank it's not every day that a fellow can get hold of five pounds in bright big gold pieces and father has promised if i win it to chip in as much more and buy me a splendid boat oh frank you're sure to get it yankee works like a slave to be sure but he hasn't half as good a head on him answered tom confidently i'm not by any means certain of that tom just see how easily he gets through his mathematics he's sure to beat me on that and i'll have to make up for it by beating him in classics anyhow it is no use worrying about it now let's hurry up and have a dip so dropping the subject the two boys ran off at a rate that soon brought them to the river bank here a lovely picture awaited them from their feet the red banks of clay and sand stretched hundreds of yards away for the tide was out until they were lapped by the river now shrunk into a narrow sluggish stream to right and left and beyond the river the wide level marshlands redeemed from the water by the patient toil of the acadians were waist-deep in verdure that swayed in long lines of light and shadow before the summer breeze not far off began the great dikes that sweep clear round the outer edge of the grand pre the only elevation on all that vast plain and now waving to their summits with dusty blossomed grass behind them the hills rose gently in fold upon fold their broad shoulders flecked with frequent patches of golden grain or the dark foliage of the orchards while over all rose a glorious summer sun that seemed to thrill the whole landscape with life and warmth and glory but the boys had no eyes for all this beauty they were far more concerned about the tide and felt inclined to resent very warmly the fact that it should be out just when they wanted to have a swim what a fraud exclaimed frank upon my word i believe the old tide is twice as much out as it is in now isn't it bunty it is sure as you're born assented tom there's nothing for it i suppose but to wait and so saying he threw himself down in the long grass his friend immediately following his example twenty yards away emery haynes was already seated with his face turned riverward apparently lost in deep thought wonder what yankee's thinking about remarked tom puzzling out some of those confounded problems he does so easily perhaps he added feelingly for he had had some humiliating experiences of his own inability to get over the pons asinorum safely or to explain why a was equal to x under certain perplexing circumstances more probably planning what he'll do with that five pounds said frank half petulantly i guess it's more likely to go into books than into a boat if he gets hold of it but he isn't going to get hold of it objected tom and then without giving frank a chance to reply he burst out oh i say frank suppose instead of waiting here we go down to meet the boar and have a race back with it frank hesitated a moment before answering for what tom proposed was a very rash thing to do what is known as the boar is the big wave produced by the onrush of water in a place where the tides rise forty fifty or even sixty feet according to the time of year the bay of fundy of which minas basin is a branch is famous for these wonderful tides and the movements of the water make a sight well worth watching the two boys had often looked on with lively interest as the returning flood rushed eagerly up the channel and over the flats until in an incredibly short time what had been a waste of red mud was transformed into a broad expanse of turbid water rather a risky business tom but i don't mind trying it i'm in the humour for almost anything today 
so come along and without more ado the boys doffed their boots and stockings rolled up their trousers and set out for the water's edge emery haynes watched them in silence until they had gone about fifty yards then as if divining their foolish design he called after them frank tom where are you going to going to meet the boar don't you want to come frank shouted back come along yankee if you're not afraid he added in a half scornful tone not the words, but the tone in which they were uttered brought an angry flush out on Emery's sallow cheeks, and without stopping to think of the folly of the thing, he too flung off his boots and started after the others. Blessed if Yankee isn't coming after all, said Tom under his breath to Frank. The chap's got plenty of grit in him. Side by side, but in silence, for somehow or other they felt ill at ease, the three boys picked their way carefully over the slippery mud and soft sand, keeping a sharp lookout for the sinkholes or quicksands in which they might easily sink to their waists or even deeper at one plunge. Hardly had they reached the edge of the channel when Frank, who had been gazing down intently toward the basin, called out, There it comes, fellows! Doesn't it look grand? a good way off still but drawing nearer with astonishing speed a wall of dark foam-topped water came rushing up the channel and over the thirsty flats it was several feet in height and behind it followed the whole vast volume of the tide the three lads had never been so close to the boar before and they stood still and silent watching the grand sight until a shout from emery broke the spell now then boys let's run for it as fast as their feet could carry them, they sped over the treacherous greasy flats, leaping the gaping gullies, turning aside from the suspicious spots, and steering straight for the place where they had left their shoes. Frank and Tom were both famous runners and soon outstripped Emery. In fact, they were more than halfway to the bank, when a sharp cry of alarm made them stop and turn to see what was the matter. One glance was enough to tell them. Twenty yards behind they saw their companion embedded nearly to the waist in a quicksand from which he was madly struggling to extricate himself, while his efforts seemed only to sink him the deeper. His situation was one of extreme peril. The boar had somewhat spent its force, but still advanced steadily. Unless Emery was rescued without delay, he would be buried beneath its pitiless flood. For one brief instant Frank hesitated, and Tom, as usual, waited for him to lead thoughts of the personal risk the small chance of succeeding and even though ever after the mere recollection of it made his cheek burn with shame of the advantage it would be to have his rival out of the way throbbed through his brain but it was only for an instant and then with a shout of keep cool yankee we're coming he grasped tom's arm and together they sprang to the rescue running with all their might they reached their imperiled schoolmate just a second before the boar did and standing on either side of the treacherous spot were able to each seize a hand and with one tremendous effort draw him out of its deadly embrace ere the great wave came sweeping down upon them tumbling them over like ninepins into the midst of its muddy surges fortunately however all three were good swimmers and they had only to allow the water to work its will with them for after a little tossing about it landed them safely on a sandbank whence they could easily wade ashore emery did not say much to his rescuers it was not his way but no one could mistake the depth of feeling expressed in the few words frank you've saved my life and i'll never forget it two weeks later the examinations came off and amid the applause of the school frank hamilton was declared winner of the star prize emery haynes being only just a few points behind him mr thompson was very well pleased at the result but there was one thing that puzzled him a good deal Emery, who was by far the best mathematical scholar in the school, had somehow or other done by no means so well in that branch as usual. In fact, he had actually left several not over-difficult questions altogether unanswered, and this more than anything else had lost him the prize. Mr. Thompson mentioned the matter to Frank Hamilton, at the same time expressing his surprise. "'I'm not surprised,' said Frank, as something that looked very like tears welled up in his eyes. When I saved Yankee's life, he said he'd never forget it. That's how he kept his word. Mr. Thompson needed no further explanation. End of section 32。section 33 of My Strange Rescue。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
recording by kathleen my strange rescue by james macdonald oxley section thirty three the game of rink hockey the part performed by canada in making contributions to the list of the world's amusements has been by no means slight lacrosse and canoeing for the warm bright days of summer snowshoeing and tobogganing for the crisp cold nights of winter these make up a quartet of healthy hardy sports the superiors of which in their appropriate season any other country might safely be challenged to show but apparently this ambitious colony is not content with the laurels already won and in the bringing of the game of rink hockey to perfection would add another to her garland for this fine game as played in the canadian cities to-day is without question a distinctly home product not that hockey is native to the soil in the same sense as lacrosse in a simpler form and under different names it has long existed in england but the difference between the game as played there on the green and played in canada on the ice is as great as that between an old-fashioned game of rounders and a professional game of baseball the most ancient account of hockey is to be found in that dear delightful old book struts sports and pastimes of the people of england where it figures under the name of bandy ball what is now called the hockey stick being then known as the bandy and there is attached to the description a comical little woodcut representing two boys in short frocks each wielding bandies almost as big as themselves playing with a ball half the size of their heads as first played in canada hockey went by various names some of which were apparently merely local hurley shiny ricketts and so forth it was played only upon the ice in winter time and there was not much pretense to rules each player taking part as best he knew how no effort toward systemizing the game appears to have been made until the year eighteen seventy five when the members of the montreal football club in search of some lively athletic amusement for the long winter months recognized in hockey the very thing they wanted at first the rules adopted for the regulation of the game were modeled upon those of the english hockey association but as the game developed many changes were found necessary in adapting it to the requirements of a rink and the rules now used by the amateur hockey association of canada are in the main original with it starting from montreal the game has made its way to halifax and st john on the east and to ottawa and toronto on the west and from the enthusiasm with which it has been taken up at these cities it actually threatens to displace tobogganing and snowshoeing in the affections of the young men let me now try to give my readers some idea of the game and the way in which it is played please picture to yourselves a skating rink with an ice surface one hundred and fifty feet in length by seventy-five feet in width at either end close to the platform are the goals consisting of two slender poles placed six feet apart and standing four feet high with small red flags at their peaks such is the field of battle and upon it the players take their places they are dressed much as they would be for football except that their feet are shod with skates of a peculiar make the heel projecting more than in an ordinary skate in order to guard against getting a nasty fall when heeling up suddenly each player is armed with a hockey stick as to the size of which the only rule is that it shall not be more than three inches wide at any part a good stick should be made of a single piece of ash bent not sawed into the proper curve of the length and weight the player finds to suit him best the bone of contention between the contending sides is called the puck and is a circular piece of vulcanized rubber one inch thick all through and three inches in diameter it is slightly elastic and will rebound from the board sides of the rink if sent violently against them a fact which enables an expert player to evade an opponent charging down to wrest it from him as by striking the puck against the boards and picking it up again on the rebound he can keep on his way unchecked the teams are arranged in the following manner goalkeeper takes his place between the posts and a little forward of them point stands about four yards out and a little to one side so as not to interfere with the goalkeeper's view down the centre cover point's position is from ten to fifteen yards out from goal and on the opposite side to point centre's post is indicated by his name and the same may be said of the right and left forwards and the half-back who supports centre 
for the control of the game there are a referee who follows it about as does the referee at football and two umpires one at either goal the sole business of the latter being to decide whether or not the puck has passed between the posts and not above the flags play begins with a bully that is the puck is placed between the two centers in the center of the rink and they after solemnly striking their sticks together three times scramble for its possession trying either to drive it ahead into their opponent's territory or behind to the halfback who immediately passes it to one of the forwards then the game goes on in lively earnest and when the teams are expert and well matched there is nothing on ice to compare with it for brilliancy and excitement the exceeding swiftness of the players movements the sudden variations in the position of the puck as under the impulse of sinewy arms it darts from end to end from side to side of the rink the incessant grind and clatter and ring of the skates the crack of the hockeys and the shouts of the eager players all combine to work up the deepest interest among the spectators and the announcement of a match between two good teams always ensures a large and enthusiastic attendance the rules by which the game is governed are easily understood so long as the puck is on the ice it is in play even though it may be behind the goal line of course a goal can be won only from the front but an opponent who is not offside may follow the puck behind the goal line and fight for the privilege of bringing it out again the rules as to onside and offside are precisely the same as in rugby football that is to say a player must always be between his own goal and the puck when he plays on it a violation of this rule calls for a bully at the spot where the wrong stroke was made the referee is the sole judge in all matters of this kind and from his decision there is no appeal the puck may be stopped but not carried or knocked on by any part of the body in striking it the stick must not be raised above the shoulder the object of this rule is to check violence and the effect of it is to make the stroke move of a push than a blow ensuring greater accuracy in shooting for goal or a fellow player and adding greatly to the grace of the game a practice player will with wonderfully little manifest effort send the puck from end to end of the rink if the ice is at all in good condition another mode of propelling the puck which is at present permissible but is in danger of being rolled out is lifting i cannot very well explain in words how it is done but by a deft turn of the wrist gained only by diligent practice the rubber is made to spring into the air and fly in the desired direction it is very effective but dangerous way of gaining round the danger consisting in the liability of players to be struck by the weighty missile and ugly blows have often been received in this way a lift at the goals is very hard to stop if sent in low and swift as i know by personal experience for once when tending goal the point of my opponent's charge down the length of the rink and without slackening speed lifted the puck and sent it past me like a bullet while i was making ready to receive it on the ice not imagining that it could lift successfully while at full speed no charging from behind tripping collaring kicking or shining is allowed and if any player offends after two warnings it is the duty of the referee to order him off the ice for the remainder of the match if the puck goes off the ice behind the goals it must be taken five yards out at right angles from the goal line and there faced as at the beginning of the game when it goes off the ice at the sides it must be faced five yards at right angles from the side boundary the goalkeeper must not during play lie kneel or sit upon the ice but must maintain a standing position he may stop the puck with his hands or feet but may not throw or kick it away from the goal he must play it properly with his stick two half hours with an intermission of ten minutes to regain breath and wipe off the perspiration is the time allowed for a match the team winning the most goals being the victors there are no other points than goals to be scored such are the principal rules and now for a few words in conclusion of a general character only those who are in good condition and at home on their skates should undertake to play hockey it is a violent game and tests both wind and muscle to the utmost the player must make up his mind to many falls and no lack of hard knocks on shins and knuckles 
for such things will happen however faithfully the contestants try to keep to the rules at the same time these very characteristics make hockey one of the manliest of sports strength speed endurance self-control shrewdness are the necessary qualities of one who would excel in it combination play is just as effective in it as in football and there is no practical limit to the skill that may be attained a very important feature of hockey is that it may be played at night since the introduction of the electric light our rinks are made as bright as day and then the many hard-working young men who are too busy all day to take part in any sport have the opportunity of an hour's splendid exercise after their work is over take it all in all there is perhaps no winter sport exclusively for men that is destined to become more popular or have more enduring favor in canada new associations are rapidly springing up and local leagues that arrange a schedule of matches for the season the boys are taking hold of the game with great zest closely imitating the tricks and artifices of their big brothers and it is safe to say that hockey has definitely taken its place among the national sports of canada end of section thirty three section thirty four of my strange rescue this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox org. recording by kathleen my strange rescue by james macdonald oxley section thirty four on the edge of the rapids hurrah lon we've got the sort of day we've been looking for at last cried alec pearson as he met his chum one lovely still summer morning no trouble about getting over to deshane's to-day right you are alec this is just the correct thing we'll start straight after breakfast hey as soon as you like provided mother's got the grub ready can't think of going without that you know no sir a basket of grub's half the fun and mother's promised me a big one ditto mine responded alec so there's no fear of our starving for a while even if we get cast away on one of the islands cast away on one of the islands echoed lon that's a great idea wouldn't it make a great sensation perhaps it would replied alec who was of a more cautious and unimaginative cast of character but i'm not hankering to try it all the same to get over to deshane's will be enough fun for me the speakers were two boys of about sixteen years of age sitting upon the front steps of a summer cottage and looking out across the splendid stretch of water that flashed like a flawless mirror beneath the fiery morning sunshine they had come out to britannia for the summer and were enjoying its fine facilities for boating bathing and canoeing as only city boys pent up in those close quarters for three-fourths of the year can enjoy such exhilarating sports the great lake de Chains filled them with profound admiration they exulted in its magnificent breadth its mighty length its cool limpid depths and most of all the glorious rapids which marked the place where it gathered itself together to become the river ottawa again and resume its steady course seaward nearly all their time they spent upon the water or in it and in the course of a month had become tolerably expert canoeists so that they did not hesitate to take long trips up the lake or across to the farther side the visit to deshane's village whose cottages were scattered along the lake shore almost opposite to britannia had been put off until they felt themselves to be thoroughly masters of their cranky craft for in order to get there it was necessary to cross the head of the rapids and to do this successfully would require both strength and skill for a week past alec and lon had felt themselves to be equal to the task but had been delayed by unfavorable weather great then was their delight when this particular saturday morning dawned clear and calm promising to be the very kind of a day they desired they started at nine o'clock taking with them for company besides their well-filled baskets wad alec's handsome hunting spaniel who had learned to behave perfectly on board the canoe their craft was one of the most approved make of which they were joint owners completely equipped with paddles cushions sails and steering gear there being not a breath of wind they had no use for the sail so the mast was not put up nor the rudder shipped 
in this enthusiastic eagerness to realize their long cherished plan lon set to paddling with all his might but alec who had the stern laughingly checked his ardor saying take it easy lon take it easy my boy there's lots of work ahead of you better not waste your muscle now alec had taken care to make inquiries of some of the britannia folk as to the course he should steer and they had all impressed upon him to go a good way straight up the lake and away from the rapids before turning toward deschenes as the current was tremendously strong and made itself felt far higher up than one would imagine looking at it from the britannia side accordingly he pointed the canoe almost due north as though he had aylmer in mind rather than deschenes and kept her on that course until lon began to grow impatient what's the use of going up so far he protested you can't feel the current here because old lark told me to make that point before striking across and he knows all about it replied alec ugh lark's an old fuss he goes away up there only because he's too lazy to pull straight across where the current's strong grumbled lon who had a passion for short cuts and who kept urging his companion to head the canoe more directly toward their destination until at last alec for very peace's sake and against his better judgment altered their course in compliance with his wishes for a hundred yards or so the paddling was no harder than before and they made no leeway so that lon could exclaim triumphantly there now didn't i tell you it's only a waste of time going so far up but when another hundred yards advance had brought the canoe fairly into the middle of the mighty stream moving with majestic flow toward the angry rapids the paddlers soon awoke to the fact that while they were still making good headway they were making considerable leeway also and that the task of getting across was going to be made much harder thereby although both noticed this neither made any remark about it at first alec because he did not wish to alarm lon and lon because he shrank from admitting that he would have been wiser to follow shrewd old lark's advice so they paddled away in silence putting plenty of muscle into their strokes and anxiously measuring their progress by landmarks on the farther shore presently their exertions began to toll upon their young frames the perspiration beaded their faces their breath came short their backs began aching and their arms grew weary lon's heart was already sinking within him and alec deeply regretted having yielded to his companion's ill-advised solicitations to disregard old lark but there was no time for reconsideration or exchanging of regrets they were beyond a doubt in the grasp of the current and must strain every nerve to extricate themselves then to add to their anxiety the weather showed signs of betraying the fair promise of the morning clouds began to obscure the deep blue of the sky and a breeze to ruffle the calm surface of the lake unable to control his feelings any longer lon broke out with more than a hint of a sob in his voice oh alec i wish we hadn't started i'm getting awfully tired and we don't seem to be making any headway at all oh yes we are lon responded alec doing his best to be cheerful paddle away we'll get across all right thus encouraged lon put a little more life into his strokes for the next few minutes and the canoe did seem to be gaining ground but the gain was only temporary the further they advanced the more they felt the force of the current yet it was too late to turn back their only course was to keep on until they had shaken themselves free from the power that was dragging them downward to destruction whether they would have been equal to this feat can only be guessed for in trying to change his position to relieve his cramped legs lon lost his balance for a moment and on attempting to recover himself did what was even worse let slip his paddle which was instantly whirled out of his reach oh alec what shall we do now he cried in dismay alec's face was white and set nothing we are powerless he said quietly it was of course futile for him to try to contend alone with the pitiless current this little canoe as if glad at having no longer to fight its way foot by foot glided gaily down towards the rapids and all that alec could do was to keep it straight in its course 
and not allow it to swing around broadside poor lon utterly overcome with terror crouched down in the bow sobbing so that he shook the frail canoe but alec was not one to yield to despair so long as anything could be done his brain was busy seeking some scheme for escape from their exceeding peril and as he glanced anxiously ahead a thought flashed into his mind that caused his eye to brighten and his pale face to light up with hope and determination right on the edge of the rapids just before the smooth swift stream broke up into tumultuous billows stood a little island a mere patch of rocks crowned with half a dozen straggling trees if he could only beach the canoe on this island they might yet be saved it was all that remained between them and certain death the island was not more than two hundred yards distant and to reach it he must make the canoe cut obliquely through the current summoning all his energies for a supreme effort he bent to his task in the meantime saying to lon be ready to jump the moment the canoe strikes for a boy of his age alec put a wonderful degree of strength into his strokes and he had the joy of seeing his frail craft obey in spite of the opposing waters until it was pointing fair for the island then with a glad hurrah he ceased fighting the current and joined forces with it so successfully as to drive the canoe straight towards the rocks he did not miss his aim with a leap as though it were alive the canoe rushed at the island and ran half its length out of the water a sound of splintering wood telling that its bottom had suffered in so doing with feelings of indescribable relief the boys sprang out upon the solid ground and instantly embracing one another danced about in sheer exuberance of joy the rapids were cheated of their prey and the worst of the peril was past having thus given vent to their feelings they proceeded to examine the canoe and were glad to find that its bottom was not very badly injured and could be easily repaired their next thought was how could they get off the island they were safe enough there for the present of course and they had sufficient provisions if carefully husbanded to keep them from starving for three or four days but they had no idea of playing the part of robinson crusoe and his man friday even for that short space of time if it could possibly be helped so they got on the edge of the island nearest britannia and alec held up his paddle with his coat on it as a signal of distress while both shouted at the top of their voices their shouts were drowned in the ceaseless roar of the rapids but after a while their signal of distress was observed and soon a crowd had gathered on the shore opposite them and there was great excitement everybody was eager to help but nobody knew just what to do all sorts of schemes were suggested for the rescue of the boys the most feasible of which was to have a large boat go out above the rapids and anchor there and then send down a smaller one secured by a rope with which it could be hauled back again for no boat could by any possibility be rowed back against that mighty current but there were two difficulties in the way of this plan there was no boat at the village big enough and no rope long enough for the purpose so some other way must needs be devised the morning wore away and the afternoon shadows lengthened without anything being done and it looked as though the boys would have to stay on the island all night when the cry was raised that there was a raft coming down and sure enough the great towing steamer followed by a huge raft of square timber hove into sight far up the lake the problem of the boys deliverance need no longer he worried over the raftsmen would solve it in short measure the big raft reached britannia just long enough before dark to allow of the rescue being accomplished the moment the foreman heard of the boy's situation he detailed six of his best men three being indians and three french canadians to bring them off landing their largest bun a kind of boat peculiar to lumbering being flat on the bottom and very high at both bow and stern they rowed off briskly towards the rapids laughing and chafing one another and evidently deeming it quite a bit of fun while the crowd gathered on the shore watched their every movement with breathless attention managing their clumsy-looking but most seaworthy craft with perfect skill they made an easy landing on the island took the boys on board and then waving their hats to the admiring onlookers continued gaily on into the very midst of the boiling rapids 
the big bun bobbing about like a cork seemingly at the entire mercy of the waters yet all the time being cleverly steered by her crew and after an exciting passage during which the boys hardly breathed shooting out into the smooth stretch below the rapids without having taken so much as a single drop of water on board a hearty cheer broke from the delighted spectators at this happy conclusion to the affair and a few moments later the boys were in their midst receiving the embraces of their overjoyed parents and the vigorous congratulations of the others the rescuing raftsmen were well rewarded for their timely service and master lawn learned a lesson in caution that he is not likely soon to forget end of section thirty four section thirty five of my strange rescue this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen my strange rescue by james macdonald oxley section thirty five theo's tobogganing triumph the boys of bridgetown were all agreed that there had not been such a winter for tobogganing since they could remember and if they ever thought of the weather clerk at all it was with feelings of the deepest gratitude in the first place it began with a frost that made the ground as hard as iron and the waters were in bible language hid as with a stone then upon this came one fall of snow after the other until there was nothing left to wish for in that direction and the hoys were thoroughly content not only was the weather clerk thus considerate but nature had already been kind enough to provide them with the finest site for a toboggan slide imaginable the placid stream which bore the name of bass river spread out into a broad reach just before it came to their town and on one side the bank rose up into a steep bluff whose grass-grown face slanting right down to the water's edge without a break or gully seemed intended for no other purpose than to afford the boys a splendid coasting ground when well sheeted with snow and the boys knew right well how to appreciate their privileges i can assure you to go out to bass river bluff on a saturday afternoon was to witness a scene well worth seeing the hill would fairly swarm with boys and girls enjoying themselves to the top of their bent from patsy cahill the washerwoman's ragged urchin with his curious apology for a sled constructed out of old barrel staves on which he dared to take only short slides from a little way up the hill and which he sorely regretted was not big enough to carry him and katy at the same time to ralph masterson the eldest son of the rich and haughty judge with his big toboggan so finely varnished and comfortably cushioned that could take four persons down every trip the young people of the town would turn out and make the valley ring with their laughter and shouting one of the most regular attendants at bass river bluff was theo ross who with his widowed mother lived in a cosy cottage on the opposite side of the river from the town and consequently was looked upon as one of the country boys although he came in every day to the high school there was a good deal of rivalry between the boys of bridgetown and those who lived in the scattered settlement across the river which was known as riverside a rivalry that led to all sorts of matches and now and then to fights no one took more hearty interest in this rivalry than theo he was a strong stout hearty lad of sixteen up to anything as the saying is and was generally looked upon by the riverside boys as their leader one saturday evening he came home in high spirits whoop did he do din do he shouted as he burst into the house why theo what are you so excited about inquired his mother looking up with a glad smile of welcome for the boy that was the joy and pride of her life excited perhaps i am and no wonder for aren't we going to have the biggest tobogganing match next saturday afternoon that you ever heard of replied theo at the same time giving his mother a hug and a kiss that were a credit to both for it showed how thoroughly they understood one another mrs ross was a wise not less than a loving mother and one of the proofs of her wisdom was the hearty interest she took in her son's sports as well as in his studies 
he had lost his father when but a baby and she had determined to fill the vacant place to the best of her ability so from the very first she entered heartily into his amusements and made herself his companion as far as she could theo never played cricket or lacrosse so well as when his mother was looking on and no applause was sweeter to him than the clapping of her hands he therefore felt sure of an attentive listener as he proceeded to unfold the cause of his excitement well you know mother the bridgetown boys have been boasting all winter about their toboggans and saying that they can run away from anything in riverside and our fellows have been talking back at them until both sides have begun to feel pretty hot over it we've had a lot of races but they didn't settle anything because sometimes the bridgetown boys would win and sometimes the riverside so this afternoon i proposed to ralph masterson that next saturday afternoon he should bring a team of four toboganers from the town and i would bring four from the country and we'd settle the question without any more talk well but theo dear won't it be dangerous for so many as eight to coast down together you might run into each other asked mrs ross rather anxiously oh you dear innocent laughed theo that's not the way we'll do at all only two will go down at a time you see there will be first of all four heats and we'll draw lots for our places in the heats then the four winners will run against each other making two more heats and then there will be a final heat in which the two winners will run together and that will decide that seems a very good arrangement said mrs ross approvingly whose idea was it mostly mine mother it's the best way to get fair play all around answered theo will you have any difficulty in choosing your team oh not much walt powell and rob sands will be on for sure they have good toboggans and they can steer splendidly the fourth chap i'll pick out through the week well theo you must do your best to win for i'll be there to watch you you may depend upon it i will for your sake as much as for the honor of riverside replied theo giving his mother a loving kiss before he went off to his room for a wash it seemed an awfully long week to the excited boys impatient for the coming contest theo had many applicants for a position on his team and having after careful deliberation decided in favor of fred fellows the four boys had many an earnest consultation as to the best way of securing success on friday evening the others brought their toboggans over to mrs ross's and they spent an hour or two in seeing that the bottoms were perfectly smooth the gut lashings all taunt and the cushions secured beyond the possibility of slipping they were not a little disturbed at some rumors that had reached them of ralph masterson having sent off to the capital and got a new toboggan of a kind just lately patented which was made differently from the others and reported to be much faster if this was true ralph had done rather a mean thing for although not expressly stipulated it was generally understood that the toboggans to be used in the contest were such as they already had and not new ones imported for the purpose but as theo sensibly said it was no use worrying until they knew for certain so hoping for the best they parted for the night saturday proved as fine as could be wished and early in the afternoon a crowd began to gather on bass river bluff besides the honor of the championship judge masterson had offered a handsome prize to the winner in the shape of a silver cup and there was no end to the excitement the judge himself and all his family were present so too were theo's mother and parents of the other contestants so too patsy cahoe holding katie with one hand and dragging his forlorn little barrel stave sled with the other everybody in bridgetown and riverside that could come had come and the flat top of the bluff was fairly black with spectators by three o'clock all the competitors had arrived when ralph masterson appeared theo gave one sharp glance at his toboggan then turned to his companions with his face the picture of indignation it's true boys after all ralph's got one of those new-fangled affairs i read of in the papers they say they can go like smoke he hasn't done the square thing but we're not beaten yet for all that and theo looked proudly down at his toboggan which had won as high a reputation for speed as the owner had for skill it took half an hour to draw lots for the heats and then at last all was ready and judge masterson acting as starter called out the first pair 
besides the steerer each toboggan was to carry another person for ballast fred fellows was the first of theo's team to try his fortune amid breathless silence and suspense he put his toboggan in position beside his opponents are you ready asked the judge they both nodded then go and with half a dozen quick steps they pushed their toboggans over the brow of the hill and flinging themselves on sideways with one leg extended for a rudder shot down the steep slope like arrows from a bow for some time they kept side by side then fred was seen to swerve and slew and the bridgetown boy to slip ahead the advantage was not much but he kept it to the end and the first heat went against riverside the bridgetown boys cheered lustily and the riversiders looked rather glum until the next heat was run and resulted in a win for the latter thus making things even the riverside entry took the third heat also and their hopes ran high but cooled down again when the fourth heat went to bridgetown the result of the first round accordingly was that two of each side had won their heats theo and ralph being of course among the winners the excitement grew more and more intense as after a little breathing space the second round was called curiously enough theo and ralph did not come together in this round either having each another opponent whom they vanquished easily as they stood on the hill together at the conclusion of the round ralph turned to theo with a smile which betokened perfect confidence in himself and pointing to his new toboggan said she's a hummer there is nothing on the bluff to touch her do you think it was just the square thing ralph to get that toboggan when it was understood we were to race with what we had already asked theo quietly pooh replied ralph tossing his head defiantly everything's fair in love and war as he turned away and swung his toboggan round it came in contact with patsy cahoe's barrel stave sled with a muttered oath ralph sprang toward the obstruction and kicking it high into the air the clumsy little thing fell to the ground shattered into useless fragments poor patsy gave a cry as he saw his plaything demolished but ralph's angry face silenced him again and with tears running down their cheeks he and katy proceeded to gather up the pieces get ready for the final heat called out judge masterson mrs ross pressed forward to theo's side and whispered in his ear good luck to you my boy with every eye upon them ralph and theo drew their toboggans into position the difference between the two toboggans was very marked theo's was a particularly fine one of the ordinary kind but ralph's was made of narrow hardwood strips secured by screws instead of thongs and had a sharp racing look that could not be mistaken just as the contestants were ready to receive their ballast theo's glance fell upon patsy cahoe pressing forward eagerly on the edge of the crowd watching him with his whole soul in his eyes he knew well how intensely the little fellow hoped for his success and suddenly an idea flashed into his mind which caused him to call out to judge masterson a minute's time please sir all right my lad replied the judge then to the surprise of everybody theo after whispering to walter powell whom he had first intended to be his companion on the toboggan and who now drew aside beckoned to patsy cahoe patsy approached bashfully jump on in front patsy said theo briskly you're to be my ballast this time there was a murmur of astonishment from the crowd as the ragged little chap awkwardly got into his place and theo did not miss the contemptuous curl of his opponent's lip but neither did he fail to catch the pleased approving look his mother sent him a moment more and everything was in readiness the spectators held their breath as the judge lifting his right hand asked are you ready and then bringing it down with a crack into the other shouted then go as if shot from a bow the two toboggans leaped over the bluff and went rattling down the smooth slope side by side and head to head down down they went theo and ralph with iron grip and hard pressed toe keeping them straight in their course and patsy and the other ballas clinging fast to the handrail it was the proudest moment of patsy's life and one that he would never forget just as the toboggans still perfectly even approached the bottom of the declivity where the track ran out on to the bosom of the river ralph struck a slight obstacle which caused it to swerve and then to slew with a vicious dig of his toe he tried to bring it round straight again in his hot haste he overdid it 
and the head swung round until the toboggan went broadside to the track scratching bumping cracking until like a flash it came bang against the side of the slide pitching its passengers out upon their heads and splitting one of the thin strips clean in two in the meanwhile theo and patsy amid the cheers of the crowd on the hill were speeding smoothly over the ice winners by nearly a hundred yards great was the delight of the riverside folk at their champion's victory and many of the bridgetownians joined in congratulations too for ralph masterson was far from popular among them when theo reached the top of the bluff his mother hastened to him her face beaming with pleasure as she said i am very proud of your victory theo but i am prouder still of the heart that prompted you to take patsy Cahoe. End of section thirty five. End of my strange rescue by James MacDonald Oxley.